some few technical stuff going on. We're ready. On. Dr. Ong, we're ready. Let's go. All righty. Well, as Kevin said, thank you for uh, bearing with us as we got things uh, together. Uh, today, I'm Paul Winsky. I am the uh, commercial horticulture agent here in Harris County. Joining me today is uh, briefly Dr. Mung Mung Gu, who is at a training in San Antonio, uh, Dr. Kevin Ong, who is at College Station, and Laura Miller, who is a uh, county extension agent in commercial horticulture up in the uh, Fort Worth uh, area. So uh, we are glad that you could join us today. Um, I'm going to kick things off and I'm just going to cover uh, winter greenhouse prep. I am hoping if you are a producer or if you have a greenhouse uh, that you've uh, probably taken care of some of these things already. But if not, um, these are just a few reminders uh, as that colder weather is coming in. I know uh, we were just talking and I think Dallas is supposed to get down to near freezing. Um, I'm in Houston, so we are... They're calling for colder weather, but we're not getting close to freezing yet. So um, first thing, if you've got a poly house, let's make sure that you're checking for tears or holes and make sure we get them patched. Uh, we don't need that draft. You don't want to have a, any extra you know, cold air coming in or you're running the heat and it's going right out that opening. Um, that would be not be a good thing. That would be a waste of money uh, and your crops would suffer in the long run. So let's make sure initially we're checking those houses. Uh, if you've got polycarbonate, let's make sure uh, everything is secured properly uh, to the trusses. And uh, if you need to replace any screws to make sure there's uh, to minimize gaps, uh, let's make sure we do that also. Uh, with a plastic uh, or however you attach it, especially with the wiggle wires, they can get bent out of shape, um, get sort of overextended over time. Uh, so if you have any that are missing uh, or damaged, let's go ahead and get those replaced. Uh, especially if you're missing because you don't want that uh, potential spot for uh, under high winds that we could possibly uh, have some damage, we could have some pool. Uh, if you are in an area where for Further north in the uh, state where you m possibly can have some uh, uh, snow load or ice load, uh, let's make sure everything is buttoned up properly because um, we want to make sure that we don't have any uh, structural damage uh, to the uh, greenhouse uh, if you uh, possibly can uh, deal with that uh, later in the year. Um, I know most uh, greenhouses uh, pretty much are all electronic now, but if you do have an analog thermostat, um, you know, give it a check. There's, uh, depending on the manufacturer, uh, they can work with you on how to calibrate it. Uh, you know, hopefully it, it, it's, you know, not sitting out in full sun or, you know, it, it's got some protection to it. But uh, even with it being, in, if it is in full sun, uh, you know, over the course of uh, several growing seasons, you know, those temperatures could drift, uh, the uh, uh, integrity of it can drift a little bit. So make sure we are, you're properly uh, calibrating it. Um, so it will, uh, you know, turn on whether, what stage of heating it is, uh, it'll turn, at, turn on properly at the uh, uh, temperature uh, that you have it set. Uh, if you've got double uh, poly uh, and you've got uh, an inflation system, uh, make sure you the uh, motor's working properly. You've got the right static pressure in there. You're not overinflating or underinflating, which would even be worse. Um, so you know it, it's really a good time of year uh, to make sure that uh, your house is buttoned up properly, um, that you're able to use the uh, the heat and your fuel efficiency, uh, you know, in, in a good manner. Uh, it's good management practices, and it's going to save you money uh, in the long run. Uh, horizontal airflow, uh, make sure the fans, A, are running properly, uh, that they are oriented properly uh, to move that air horizontally. Uh, you've got to remember now if, you know, uh, at least when we were down here, our houses were open up, you know, most of the year, and this is the time of year things would start to get closed up. 
condensation is going to build up in these houses. Uh, so make sure those fans are uh, set up properly. Uh, the images here show uh, the, the, the various uh, orientations and settings uh, for setting up those fans. Uh, so you will get the proper air movement. Um, that air movement not only cuts down on that condensation or helps with that, it helps with circulating the air, as we would expect. Um, the warm air, it helps um, uh, circulate it. Uh, and the other thing is we get proper air movement, we're going to be able to cut down on our disease issues in it with the crops that are in that house. So um, very vital, uh, very important to make sure those fans are working properly and properly oriented. Um, with the heaters themselves or the burners, um, let's make sure they're, they're, you know, we blow out those ports, uh, clean out any debris that may have uh, accumulated. Uh, the heaters themselves, you know, there could be spider webs in there, sometimes birds get in there, they like to make their nests. So, uh, you know, take the time to, um, you know, that's an investment uh, that that's uh, cost you some money to, to put that in. So let's make sure we clean it up uh, and we get it in proper working condition uh, prior to when you're going to need it. The last thing you want to do is uh, have to be running, running around uh, the day before a, uh, a, a freeze event is going to occur uh, because you didn't take the time to um, uh, make sure you're equipment was up and running properly. So um, uh, go ahead and, and clean it up and make sure everything is ready uh, for when that first freeze event does occur. Uh, check that vent pipe uh, that's coming out from that heater. Uh, I don't know how many times when you go through some houses and or you're work, walking on the outside and you see them bent or leaning or you know 180 degrees pointing down because uh, the bar that attaches it to the side of the greenhouse hasn't been fixed. Uh, so this is all you know. The, the, there are safety issues there also. Uh, so make sure uh, the integrity of that vent pipe is 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 sound. Uh, and this way, when, when that heater is running, uh, there's no CO or carbon, carbon monoxide buildup. Uh, things vent out, uh, and the crops and the plants are, are happy, and you're happy as the, uh, the grower. Uh, and then last but not least with that heater, um, turn on the gas supply, make sure you've got proper flow, uh, and, and just start that heater. Uh, make sure it, it, it's blowing hot air for you. Uh, make sure the, uh, the pilot is lit, everything is, is good to go. Uh, and then this way, you'll just uh, probably sleep a little bit better, uh, knowing that everything's in place uh, when those cold temperatures are coming. Uh, you've got your thermostats all set, you've got everything buttoned up, uh, and you'll be prepared and, and ready to go uh, when that cold weather does come in. So uh, with that, uh, let me stop sharing and I'm going to toss this over to Laura. And I'm going to talk about landscape preparations for, for cold weather, where Paul was talking about um, um, Let's see. Um, greenhouse. Greenhouse, yes, <laughs> obviously. Greenhouse preparations for cold weather. Can't do two things at once very well, very well at all. Okay, so let's see. Um, this is my last slide, but it's actually a good first slide too. So I'll just um, click backward here though in our my presentation to the beginning. Um, I started out this morning looking at our National Weather Service um, warning here, and uh, they told me that that it might freeze tonight, and I, I was not shocked about that. Um, so, you know, for those of you that are looking at the first freeze of the year, uh, it reminded me of what Dr. George Ray McKitchen always used to say. There are three freezes that'll get you, and I can't imitate his voice, but if you know him, you can probably hear it in your head right now. And, and what he was meant was the, the first one, the middle one, and the last one. So the first one is what we're going to have tonight, and it's that one that, that can sometimes sneak up on you, though we are actually at about our usual first frost date. Um, that's going to be different depending upon where you live in Texas. 
but it, sometimes it finds you in a situation where even if it's kind of the normal day, like it is for us here, your plants may not be really acclimated for a freeze. Um, yesterday morning when I was leaving for work, it was, uh, I think, 78 or 79 degrees at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, and today it was uh, probably 40 eight or 49 degrees. So we had a, a temperature drop of about 30 degrees in one day. And tonight we'll get below freezing. So the plants haven't been going through that slow, steady, kind of getting a little bit colder, getting ready for cold. So it's always kind of hard uh, when you hit that first freeze, especially if it's a really hard freeze and that's not what we're looking at here. But if it's a really hard freeze, your plants are really not ready for it. So acclimation is what you want on that first one. Um, I don't know if we've got that this year or not. And the second one's the middle one, and that's the really cold freeze of the year. And if you remember earlier in 2021, we had that middle one and we had it in the middle of February. Sometimes it comes in late December. Uh, sometimes it comes in January, but it's that, that time when the temperatures get much more cold than they do any other time in the year. And sometimes we get those really extreme temperatures like we did this year. So that's, that's also hard to prepare for. You hope that you're acclimated for that a little bit, but sometimes those temperatures can just go down lower than what you would expect for your hardiness zone. And that can be really difficult for your plants. Um, and then the last one is the other really difficult one, especially for fruit growers. Um, starts kind of warming up in the spring, all the plants kind of start getting going and then it freezes again. And that's when we lose a lot of fruit production. It's also hard on our landscape plants. Sometimes you'll lose that, the only time of year that that plant may bloom, you'll lose that, that flowering season and that's kind of sad for everybody. So you probably won't lose your plants, but you'll often lose flowers and fruit with that last freeze, that late freeze in the spring. So the National Weather Service has a little bit of preparation advice. They said, consider protecting tender vegetation and shutting off your sprinkler systems. And, and that's really good advice. So I'm gonna just give you a little bit more than that. So this was my yard yesterday morning when it was so warm and I was leaving for work. And you can see if you're observant that the concrete is wet, not that my sprinkler system is you know, totally um, throwing water on the concrete, but you can see that a little bit of it is wet there up on the steps. Um, so I did run the sprinkler uh, Tuesday night. So why did I do that? Well, I knew it was gonna freeze and I really wanted to go into the freeze with moist soil. So moist soil will hold on to heat it, much better than dry soil. Um, that water, it's kind of contrary to the way you feel as a person. If you're wet and it's cold, you're miserable, but cold soil is warmer than dry soil for your plants. So don't think, oh, my plants are gonna be miserable if I, if I get them wet here before it gets cold. They won't, it'll be helpful for them to have uh, moist soil because that's gonna hold more heat. Um, even as much as five degrees of, of temperature rise over moist soil versus dry soil. And that's pretty significant when you're talking about predicted temperatures of maybe 31 or so. That's the difference between freezing and not freezing. Um, that, but after you irrigate, and this is what I'm gonna do when I get home, you should turn off that irrigation system, turn off your sprinkler system, um, disconnect your hoses from the hose bibs, cover those hose bibs if you have covers for those. Um, make sure that you don't, I think uh, Becky was going to maybe talk about getting your sprinklers ready for a freeze, but uh, she's not on today. She couldn't join us. So I'm going to try to do that justice. I'm not going to do as good a job as she would, but you don't want to have that man-made ice event. That's the worst thing ever. And I see it almost every time we freeze, I'll be driving to work and you'll see some place where the sprinklers went off and the, the water's frozen onto the street or onto the sidewalk. And that's really what you want to avoid. Um, you also want to avoid a freezing water inside your irrigation system. Um, most of the time, uh, water's going to go down under the ground. The pipes are down under the ground. It's going to be insulated. But if water's up in the 
above ground exposed parts. That's where it can freeze. And we saw a lot of damage to systems last February from the water that was up in the top of the systems. Um, Dr. Ong may back me up on this, but uh, you don't want to irrigate a lot in the winter because, you know, you can just develop more diseases that way. Paul already said most diseases develop better with more moisture, and that's true in the landscape, very, very true. So you don't want to irrigate things when you don't need to. You can also have the, the side benefit, really, or it's an important side benefit of, of saving water, conserving water, and saving money if you turn your irrigation system off when you don't need it in the winter. So I only turn it on when I want to run it. I just turn it off and leave it off for, for the whole entire um, cold period or our typical frost-free, you know, from November to March. I don't run it regularly. I do run it if so I Laura, need to. Yep. Yeah, leave, leave that slide on. I'll jump in here and, and share a little bit of the experience of what we see in the uh, plant clinic and so on. Sure. About water. So folks, water is, is a two-edged sword. You know, you need it, and sometimes you, you have to have it, and other times you can do without it. Uh, so a lot of times in urban areas, and, and, and this is more experiential working with uh, landscape maintenance folks, is um, if they manage the irrigation, great, then they can control it better. But if you're dealing with a homeowner and you're coming in, one of the best advice is to, sometimes tell them to just quit watering uh, when, when temperatures start to cool down. Several things here. The plants do slow down in transpiration. The plants move to dormancy. So when they don't pick as much water, your soil environment is going to stay wetter. And when it's wetter, you are going to uh, have the necessary moisture that pathogens and microbes would like. Now, keep in mind, we are in a very unique situation in, in most parts of Texas. If you're talking about the Dallas-Fort Worth area, you know, there are still going to be those cold days, but then warm days. Like if we're going to get the freeze tonight up there, guess what? The next week, it could be 70, 80. Um, I'm talking about soil temperatures, which means that while the plant might be saying, you know, time to take a nap, the pathogen could still be active. So when you have way too much water in the soil, the plant is dormant. The roots are still in that moist environment. It's going to be a softer root for attacks. So that's, the, that's one of the reasons why uh, we do tend to get a lot of root rot problems. Um, you know, whether through the winter in, in, in southern parts of Texas or, or central parts of Texas. And then you, we see a lot of those two pop in uh, in the early spring, when things start to come out of dormancy, then you see plants not doing as well. Plants start to uh, 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 decline because the roots had been destroyed or gone over the winter. So best things that you can do, as, as Laura mentioned, turn off the irrigation system. Water is needed. I mean, there are times, there have been years that it's been so dry that you do need to water. The plants need some water. Uh, through the winter, but not so much that the soil stays wet. So if, if you deal with a homeowner or something, I guess a best uh, way to, to, to kind of a general rule of thumb teach them is stick your finger in that first inch. If it's sopping wet, that's not good. If it's moist, that's great. Uh, if it's dry, water. And, and, and use that as a general rule of thumb of not um, over inundating its soils with water and creating conducive environments for the pathogens. So back to you, Laura. Sure. So Kevin, you said, you know, stick your finger in the soil. It's kind of funny because Tarrant Regional Water District has a new ad campaign and it's, you can save thousands of gallons with a single finger. And it, they mean like turn your system off when you don't need it, just punch that off button. But you can also use your finger to check soil moisture. You can, you, if you don't want to stick your finger in the soil, you can use, you know, a soil moisture sensor if you have one, a cheap one, you can get it anywhere, not very expensive and use that. But yeah, you can use your finger for a lot of things. Um, 
final thing on this slide is mulch. So this is actually one of those times when you're just like nature is so great and the 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 circle of life is so wonderful and and everything is there when you need it and the leaves right now are there when you need them. They're falling off the tree. This is a great time to get them up off of turf areas cuz you know turf can kind of not do so well under a nice thick layer of leaves. You, you want to either mow them and, and mulch them very well in a turf area or just rake them off and put them in your flower beds. If you don't like the way that looks, I, I mean, some people think that just looks kind of messy. You could just come in there and put a nice little layer of bark mulch over the top. It looks very attractive, but you've got a thicker layer of mulch, uh, courtesy of your own trees and keeping all that organic material on your own landscape versus you know sending it away is kind of a great way to to conserve um, nitrogen in the nitrogen cycle and to and to make your soil health improved and just improve your soil drainage if it's clay soil and your soil water holding capacity if it's sandy soil. So there's really no downside to keeping those leaves um, on the landscape in the appropriate areas in your flower beds and under your trees. All right, so a couple of special situations I want to talk about. One is containers. Containers are, because the roots are exposed, they're not protected down in the soil, they're much more likely to freeze. So sometimes when your plant roots would be fine down in the soil, like they probably would be tonight, um, a container uh, plant might be more injured than a, than a plant growing in the soil. That's always gonna be true. So there's some things you can do if, if you have space indoors, I actually brought a, a plant in to, to work with me this morning because I was like, ah, I need to put that somewhere. I have a nice windowsill here in the office. If you have space indoors that has light, a garage is okay for a very temporary storage of containerized plants, but it's not, it's not typically good unless you happen to have garage windows and supplemental light that you could make it uh, light enough in there for your plants. Because um, we're talking about plants that typically do grow all winter, tropical plants or, or subtropical plants that are, that are not cold hardy. Um, they're going to need light. So you can bring them in if, you can, if you've got a good space for them inside. You can bring them in temporarily if that's what you need to do. If you need to leave them outside, just at least push them together. Put your containers and, and, and push them together and push them up against a wall. Um, that'll help them protect each other. Um, and you can consider covering containers. And we're gonna talk about covers next. That uh, woven frost cloth, which you can see in this picture, you can see there's a, this is a strawberry field actually. You can see two kinds of cold protection. One is a low tunnel, which is kind of a little bitty miniature greenhouse. And Paul just talked about greenhouses, but this is probably the simplest, cheapest, shortest greenhouse you could, you could have, a low tunnel. Um, and then there's also just frost protection cloth on the strawberries. And you can see the low tunnels on the left and the frost protection cloth on the right. Both of those are, are great. Um, frost protection has a limited range, but when you're talking about a light freeze like this, it can make all the difference in the world. Um, probably last year in our very cold temperatures, snow cover was one of the things that saved us because it was kind of like frost protection cloth on, on the low growing plants and they got a lot of protection from the snow. Um, but you can provide that at any time. It'll give you two to four degrees Fahrenheit depending upon the thickness of the cloth. Um, plastic on a frame will give you more cold protection but you don't want plastic laying directly on plants. You've got to really create that mini greenhouse in there. Um, some people use Christmas lights to, to provide a little extra heat and that's okay. Uh, do keep in mind that new LED lights don't really put off a lot of heat, so you need the old-fashioned C7 lights if you're going to count on Christmas lights to provide heat. And Paul, I've even seen a, a nursery, a greenhouse grower that put Christmas lights underneath the bench to provide bottom heat for propagation in the winter. It was kind of kind of clever, you know, and it was also kind of festive. I, I, I thought it was, it was cute. Anyway. Served two um, purposes. Two purposes, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, so, and then the next thing I wanted to talk about was cutting things back. So sometimes because you need to do things when you need to do them, 
um, you may have already gone out in the landscape and cut back some of those summer perennials and mulch them. Um, if you haven't already done that, um, you can wait until after the freeze and do it later. Um, that extra plant material does provide some protection to the to the crown and roots of the plant, so it's okay to leave it there until it until you get it that freeze and then cut it back. And as I said uh, last time we talked, I I think you should leave your grasses uh, through the winter for that the beauty that they bring. But I understand that a you know a brown Turks cap plant is not quite as gorgeous, so you do want to kind of cut those back to give yourself a. Um, a tidier appearance. And then also in the spring, when things come out, you won't have as much work to do um, cutting things back then. So, so you get to decide though, it's okay. It's not really damaging to the plant to leave it there. It does provide some protection. You can cut it back when you're, when you're ready and when you have time. Uh, you do wanna make sure though, that, that you have mulch on perennials uh, that'll help protect them through the winter. And so my last slide is about prioritizing. Obviously, um, as Paul said, it's always great to have your preparations done before you really need them, but sometimes you end up kind of in a pinch and you've got to try to decide how to spend your time. Um, obviously, annual plants, well, some of our annual plants are super tough. There's some, this is a winter landscape and there's, you know, some Swiss chard and there's some pansies there in the background. Those are probably going to make it through whatever kind of cold temperatures we have. But even if they don't, most of the time you don't want to protect annuals because they're not the most significant investment in your landscape. Well, that's not always true, especially if you just put them out. Like if I just planted my pansies yesterday, um, they're not well established. Their roots really haven't had time to grow. I've just spent a whole bunch of money and bought a bunch of plant pansies, then I might want to cover them. Probably not tonight with the temperatures we're expecting, but if it was going to be in the 20s, I might want to do that. Um, on the other hand, though, if I have some kind of semi-tender perennials that are, that are important to me, I would want to try to protect those. Um, also, uh, as I kind of mentioned with the pansies, if something's newly installed, if you just planted something, it obviously hasn't had a chance to, to grow out its root system, to get adapted to its environment. That's a plant that's vulnerable and you're probably gonna to wanna to prioritize protecting that one. So you might wanna cover anything that's just newly installed. I sometimes just use the nursery container that it came out of, turn it over, put it on top of it. You can protect a, a newly planted, um, small um, small shrub or, or perennial that way. Um, the next thing I would say is, you know, what's, what's easy and fast? What do you have time for? Um, turning off your irrigation system takes just a second, so you should definitely do that. Running it doesn't take a whole lot longer, so if you, if you have time to do that this afternoon, that would be fine, and then turn it off. Um, some things are a lot more effort. If you're gonna cover things with frost cloths, you've gotta have the frost cloth, you've gotta have the time and labor to get it out there and get it covered. So, you know, those things might be a little less of a priority, but everybody can use water to their advantage. Um, and that's pretty easy. And then the thing I'm really thinking about on that last point is, um, you know, you wanna think about having a landscape that and I know we all got fooled this year, but that is well adapted to your climate. That is um, generally able to handle the typical weather that we get. It's never gonna be perfect. You're always gonna have those, those weather events that throw you for a loop. But if you, if you can plan ahead and choose plant material carefully, um, that'll be a long lasting benefit. The other thing I think is a long lasting benefit is mulch. Mulch is great for temperature moderation, both in the winter and the summer. Uh, mulch gives your landscape a, a nice look. It's always a worthy effort. So improve your soil with organic mulch. It's always worth doing. So I would say mulching should always be a priority in terms of landscape protection. Um, other things are, you know, they're kind of like things that you have to go out and do, and then you've got to undo them too, because you can't leave those covers up forever and you can't leave, you know, you can't leave um well, you can't enjoy your landscape if you leave them out forever. So I know some people do, but you, it's just not its just not as great as having a landscape that's already um, able to handle most of the weather that we get. 
So that's all I've got. Um, Paul, do you have anything else you want to talk about or Kevin? I am good. Good. Anybody have any questions they want to share with us about winter preparations? You can put a question in the chat. Nope. Okay, then, folks, get ready to bundle up. It's getting cold. Um, our next chat with Green Aggies is uh, the very first Thursday in December. And I think we're trying to put together kind of a year in review. And so we hope to see you all then. Um, and until then, I'll just. Uh, well, be before that, too, folks, if there are topics of interest um, for you guys, for, for us to go over, because when we started this, um, you know, with COVID was to to actually have a time for several of us specialists to sit down with county agents and and talk about things that are going through and happening. Uh, uh, so as, as things are coming out of, of it. Um, yeah, popping stuff that 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 you would be interested, you would like to be reminded of. We'll throw things in, um, you know, on on things that are of importance uh, in terms of plant disease stuff. I'll try and throw that in, and obviously uh, a lot of um, materials or, or, or things that topic of discussion will focus on urban type situations, ornamentals, uh, whether it be turf, woody ornamentals, or trees. I uh, do want to point out, I think early next year, uh, there will be a, uh, I guess, a review at some point with Dr. Dave Apple on, on, on trees, especially one, you know, almost up to one year after the winter storm, Uri, what's the outlook, what's the, what was the outlook and what actually happened? And I can tell you this, that to, to this day, we've been getting a lot of questions uh, at the clinic, including samples that come in with trees having their bark popped off. So it was something that, that Dr. Dave Apple, a tree pathologist that had predicted that, that six month, eight month down the road, um, that impact had been done, but you don't really see the physical symptom uh, till much later. And one of that symptom is the bark popping off. Basically the cambial layer is, is somewhat dead. And, and, and so on a lot of trees, this is not a good sign because if that cambial layer is, is dead and it actually affects the xylem and the phloem, uh, then there's a very good likelihood that that tree is going to show some kind of decline. Um, what's worse, if, if this bark pop off entirely around the trunk, so entirely girdle, uh, and when that happens, then we have a severe situation where there's going to be interruptions in the vascular system. And so you can expect to see a a decline with um, with not a very good prognosis in that type of situation. Um, hey, Kat, but, yeah. Have you mentioned that uh, uh, it was right after uh, winter storm Yuri? So it was, I think it was late February. We did quite a few uh, webinars and they're all recorded. And we actually talked about uh, in one of the episodes, we did talk about winter prep, uh, preparation. So it's all on the plant, Texas Plant Clinic uh, YouTube channel. And on the YouTube channel, there is a playlist. There is a playlist. Uh, it's called Chat with Green Aggie playlist. So I would definitely encourage everyone to go back to our, um, you know, to go back to that specific uh, episode. Uh, you know. Th thanks for the reminder. So can I get uh, Dr. Gu to actually put that link in the uh, Facebook chat, uh, the comment? Okay, let me do that. Yes. So okay. that, that'll give you guys an easy way to get back to some of those uh, uh, um, uh, 